Hello everyone. This is topics three through five. <clears throat> I called it integrals resulting in inverse trigonometric functions and more. Um, first off, we want to think of the concept of integration as just simply anti-differentiation. And if we consider our derivative formula for the inverse sine of u, it's du dx over the square root of one minus u squared, so if we want to reverse that process, basically just think of integrating, and it's going to bring us back. So we have the integration formula that if something fits the form of du over the square root of 1 minus u squared, then that's going to bring us back to the inverse sine of u. But we don't always have the luxury of this number that's under the radical here being always equal to 1. So we have to consider cases where that number is not equal to 1. So in general, we say let u be a differentiable function of x and let a be a real number. So instead of 1 minus u squared under the radical, we consider a squared minus u squared. And it turns out, and it can be shown, that what happens is that the argument u that was the result of the antiderivative because we have the little a squared instead of 1 that argument gets modified by being divided by a <clears throat> and similar formulas like for the tangent we know the derivative of the inverse tangent of u is 1 plus x squared in the, or excuse me 1 plus u squared in the denominator and du dx in the numerator. So if we want to reverse that process and consider integrating something of that form, it's going to bring us back to the inverse tangent. But now we consider the general case where instead of 1, it's a squared. And we're actually going to show this one. This one's easiest to show. That it gets modified not only by the argument being divided by a, but the coefficient gets modified by being multiplied by 1 over a. And then our inverse um, formula here that results in the inverse secant, derivative formula for inverse secant of u, recall, was fraction du dx in the numerator. Then we had the absolute value of u out in front of the square root of u squared minus 1. So we consider the fact that integration anti-differentiation integrates something like this and it'll bring us back to the inverse secant of u. But you won't see the absolute value of u. You'll just see a u out in front. And it's going to be u squared. We'll look at the general case u squared minus a squared instead of just 1. And you get the modification like the inverse tangent of 1 over a and u over a but this is where the absolute value appears. The absolute value appears in the argument of the antiderivative. Okay, so those formulas are going to be givens, but you want to try to memorize them, or at the very least, as you'll see when we get to some integration problems, we're going to kind of modify our integration strategy. But here I want to show why we get the 1 over a and the u over a, but in this case we'll do it with respect to x. I'm going to start this problem by, instead of writing it as dx over, I'm going to write it as 1 over a squared plus x squared with respect to x. And see, the goal here is actually to be able to think of anti-differentiation. It has to fit the form for what's going to result in the inverse tangent of u. That is, the formula, once again, I know it's a written up top, but I just want to have it right here for reference. The formula, once again, for the inverse tangent of u, its derivative is du dx over 1 plus u squared. So I have to identically match this form before I could say that I'm integrating to get back the inverse tangent. In other words, this a squared has to be a 1. So here's the way we could do it. We'll multiply 
inside the integral the denominator by 1 over a squared and the numerator by 1 over a squared. Because if I multiply both top and bottom or numerator and denominator by the same thing, I haven't changed anything. So we have the 1 over a squared times 1 and the 1 over a squared times the quantity a squared plus x squared. And that's with respect to x. Okay, but then here's what we'll do. We'll bring out this 1 over a squared that's in the numerator as a constant multiple, because remember a is just a real number. And so that'll be equal to 1 over a squared, and then times the integral of, and then the 1 over a squared that was in the denominator will distribute inside the parentheses. So 1 over a squared times a squared is just a squared over a squared or 1. Let's say we have a 1 in the numerator. So 1 over a squared times a squared again is 1 and then plus 1 over a squared times x squared. I'm just going to call it x squared over a squared. Okay and now I've set it up so that I'm actually ready to make a u substitution so that it will ultimately identically fit this form of du over 1 plus u squared. And that can be accomplished by taking u squared to be equal to x squared over a squared. Now, if u squared is x squared over a squared, here's one concession we have to make. We're going to take the principal or the positive square root. Now, a lot of mathematicians won't even write this first step. They would just go right to claiming that u is always positive and um, that we get x over a as our choice of u. But I'm okay if you take this step where you claim what u squared is, as long as you're willing to make that concession to take only the principal or positive square root. So we have that u equals x over a now, but remember a is a constant, so I'm going to choose to rewrite this as 1 over a times x. And now we'll calculate the differential du. The reason why I wrote it as 1 over a times x is because if a is a constant, 1 over a is also a constant. And the derivative of a, of, and a constant multiples, I should say, tag along in the differentiation process. So if I differentiate, so just treat 1 over a as a number, like 5. The derivative of 5x is 5, so the derivative of 1 over ax is 1 over a. And in differential form, the dx. <coughs> and now we'll modify by the a. You can think of dividing both sides by 1 over a, or more efficiently, multiplying both sides by a to get that a times du is the differential dx. Then when I go back to the integral, I see that I've chosen my u so that the denominator identically can be expressed as 1 plus u squared. And then in the numerator, the 1 dx that remains can be replaced by a times du, because dx is a times du. Okay, so now, with the change of variables, we have the 1 over a squared, but then times this red a right here that was satisfying the du. I'll bring that out in front. And then we can make the change of variables, and we get the integral of du over 1 plus u squared. And now the one, the red a cancels, one factor of the red a cancels with the a squared. We get 1 over a. Now this identically fits the form up here for the inverse tangent of u's derivative. So now when we reverse the process, we identically get the inverse tangent of u. At a constant at that point. 
and then we back substitute, so 1 over a, inverse tangent, u was x over a, and then plus or constant. And that would end the proof. So, I'm not going to test you on this one, um, but certainly something that needs to be mentioned. And it's going to help us actually with the kept of integration. Okay, now we have these three new integral formulas at our disposal. And so <clears throat> here's the twist to our integration strategy. When you look at an integral, you can proceed as normal. Now we're still dealing with integrating fractions. So when you look at a fraction, you could proceed as normal and ask yourself, is the denominator a power? If the denominator is a power, remember we're going to try to fit the form of u to the n. If the denominator is not a power, we're going to try to fit the form for du over u. And in example 1 and 2, I chose them so that they're kind of similar. You can see the only difference is that we have an x in the numerator of example 2. And there's no x in the numerator of example 1. So once again, if it's a fraction, remember if the denominator is a power, integral of u to the n. If the denominator is not a power, integral of d over u, which results in the natural log of the absolute value of u. And u to the n integrates to be u to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, plus or constant formally, where n is not equal to negative 1. <clears throat> so if you consider in this example one trying to fit du over u because the denominator is not a power the problem is that the du is not satisfied because if you choose u you don't have to write this down I'm just justifying it if you choose u to be that entire denominator the du is 18x dx and we can modify by the 18. The problem is we don't have that x variable. So actually question 2 fits that form. So that's an integral. Question 2 is really an integral from our first exam. But this is an integral that results in an inverse trig function and that's a little twist. If our basic integration formulas fail and what I mean by the basic integration formulas are just du over u or u to the n. Then we turn our attention to the integrals that result in the inverse trig functions. And so number one would be the case where we do so. And to get started on the process, it's still going to be u substitution, but with one extra thing, and that is your choice of a. Because all of these involved, all of these three new formulas involve a u squared and an a squared. So not only do we have to pick our u, but we have to pick our a as well. Now here's how you get started. Once you know that it's not one of the basic formulas of du over u or u to the n, just simply classify the denominator in terms of a squared and u squared. And this is always where a is the constant or the real number and u is the variable or the function of x. So classify the terms in the denominator always with respect to a squared and u squared. And then off to the side you could choose the a squared and your u squared. So our a squared in this case 16 <coughs> Are u squared 9x squared. Now again we're going to make that concession to take the principal or positive square root. So a is 4 and u is 3x. Now this is still u substitution so the du has to be satisfied and if u is 3x the differential du is 3dx and we would modify by the 3 to get that one-third du is the differential dx. 
Now, when we go back to the integral, we see that we've chosen our denominator to be of the form a squared plus u squared. Actually, let me put that in red. So that's a squared plus u squared. The differential dx has to be satisfied. And 1 over the differential dx, and 1 times the differential dx, excuse me, compare it to your du, and you see they match, just modified by the 1 third. So we could replace the 1 dx by 1 third du. And it looks like we're ready for a change of variables. And upon the change of variables, we're going to bring out the one-third integral fraction a squared plus u squared in the denominator and the differential du in the numerator. And now we can see that it fits the basic form here that results in the inverse tangent. So, oops, there it is. So 1 over a inverse tangent of u over a, that's our basic formula at this point. <coughs> okay, so we integrate. Get 1 third times 1 over a inverse tangent of u over a at our constant at that point. And back substitute, a was 4, so 1 third times 1 fourth is 1 twelfth. And then we have the inverse tangent of u, which was 3x, over a, which was 4, and then plus or constant. Okay, number 2 is just in there to help us realize when to use, when to consider the integrals that result in the inverse trig functions. See, this one's going to fit du over u, because if we take u to be the denominator, 16 plus 9x squared, the du is 18x dx, and we do have the x in the numerator that's going to help satisfy the du. So we'll go through this one rather quickly because this is something from our first exam. So we're trying to fit du over u. We've chosen u to be the entire denominator and the x dx that remains compared to our du matches just modified by the 1 18th. We would fit the basic formula, bring out the 1 18th integral. Basic formula now is du over u, which integrates to be the natural log of the absolute value of u. constant, and then finally back substitute. So 1 18th natural log absolute value, 16 plus the 9x squared, close up the absolute values plus or constant. All right, and now looking at number 3 and 4, they look identical as well, except in number 4 there's an x in the numerator, in number 3 there's not. So remember, and I'll just take this off to the side, Here's the strategy once again. If it fits the form, if we look at a, um, an integral and it is a fraction, excuse me, we ask, is the denominator raised to a power? If it is, we try to fit the form of u to the n. If it's not, we try to fit the form of du over u like we did in that last example. In this example, let's consider number three. If we were going, and you don't have to write this down, all I'm doing is justifying <coughs> why this is not the correct way to go. If you were to try to fit the form of u to the n, you would take this quantity in the denominator, swing it up to the numerator, 
as a quantity, the exponent would be negative one-half, one-half from the square root, negative from the um, shift from the denominator to the numerator. And then you would choose your u to be that quantity, 25 minus 4x squared. This is, again, in an attempt to fit the form of u to the n. Well, here's the problem. The differential du is negative 8x dx. We can modify by that negative 8, but we have that we would need the that factor of x to satisfy the du. So just like in the example one, we needed an x to satisfy the du. And we don't have it. So that's the time that we know, you know, that these methods fail, and we turn our attention to the integrals that result in the inverse trig functions. Now, again, to get a start on the problem, you don't have to even think. Just classify. Okay, there's either going to be a radical in the denominator or there's not. If there is a radical, classify what's under the radical in terms of a squared plus u squared. Or, I'm sorry, not always plus. In terms of a squared and u squared, where a squared is the constant, u squared is the variable, so this fits the form of a squared minus u squared, square root of. And for some reassurance, if you want to know if you're headed in the right direction, look at the three formulas that we have. Again, these are given formulas. This is our, our cheat sheet. I'll just flash it from now on. Um, this is our formula sheet, um, or the first page at least. And we see that the square root of a squared minus u squared in the denominator will result in the inverse sine of u over a as long as the du is satisfied, right? So therefore, we have to satisfy our du at this point. So off to the side, we claim both a squared and u squared. So a squared is 25, u squared is 4x squared. We never pick the sign, that is, a squared and u squared, are both always positive. That negative is part of the formula, okay? So the negative between the a squared and the u squared is part of the formula. And so once we get our a squared and our u squared both always positive, make the concession, take the principal square roots, a is 5 in this case, u is 2x. We can usually design them neatly so that they're perfect squares. This is still u substitution, so your du needs to be satisfied. So once we get our u, calculate du. That's just 2 of dx in this case. Routinely, we'll modify by the 2, and we have that 1 half du is the differential dx. Going back to the integral, we had already established the denominator as the square root of a squared minus u squared. The numerator is one over x is one times the differential dx. Excuse me. Compare that to your du, and we see they match. Just modified by the one half. So we could replace the one dx by one half du, and we're ready for the change of variables. We'll bring out the one half integral fraction square root of a squared minus u squared in the denominator and our du in the numerator. And so here's the formula sheet, actually. I'll use this from now on. Um, this is your cheat sheet for the next exam. It's posted in Blackboard, as we said. You've been using it for the derivative formulas, but now the integration formulas. And we can see that du over the square root of a squared minus u squared integrates to be inverse sine of u over a. And so this becomes one half, and then just the inverse sine of u over a at our constant at that point, and then we back substitute. So one half inverse sine u is 2x over a, which is 5, and then plus our constant. Okay, let's just go through number four real quick, and then we'll take a break and. Uh, move on. 
So this one does work. That is, it fits the form of the integral of u to the n, because we have this extra x variable, as we had talked about moments ago. So we're going to rewrite this, this is for, just for the sake of showing it, as x times, in an attempt to fit u to the n, 24 5 minus 4x squared raised to the negative 1 half. Again, 1 half because the square root, negative because the shift from the denominator to the numerator. We choose our u to be 25 minus 4x squared. Our du is then minus 8x, formally the differential dx. So we modify by the negative 8, we get minus 1 eighth du is x dx. Going back to the integral, we had chosen our u to be this entire quantity, so this represents u to the negative one half. Leftovers are x dx. Compare them to our du. No surprise, it works. Just replaced, so replace those by negative one eighth du. Fit the basic form, bring out the negative one eighth. Now the basic formula is u to the negative one half with respect to u. So we integrate u to the negative one half, we get u to the three halves over three halves, plus or constant. And let's see, I'm gonna get some scrap paper here. I don't want to make a careless mistake with my fifth grade arithmetic, so I'm gonna take negative one eighth times two thirds, right? So divided by a fraction, invert and multiply. So I've got negative one eighth. <coughs> times two-thirds and two goes into eight four times two goes into two once so we get negative one-twelfth so this is negative one-twelfth and then we'll put back our u which was 25 minus 4x squared now to the positive three halves and then plus or constant so it's really a calculus one integral okay all right, I think I'm going to stop right there, and then we'll come back, and we'll hopefully finish everything else. So we'll see you for part two when you're ready.